Hello, and welcome to today's behind the scenes webinar featuring the Minnesota Robotics Institute. My name is Lydia Miller, and I am a member of the College of Science and Engineering Alumni Board at the University of Minnesota. I work on the engagement committee, which helps to organize events such as this to keep CSE alumni connected to current faculty and students in order to keep them connected with the college. I'm so grateful for everybody, all the CSE alumni and friends that are able to join us today. I wanna to thank you for joining and for continuing your connection with the college. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lydia. And now let's get to the meat of the presentation. As I said, we have a lot of presenters to get through, so I'm gonna get things started by handing it over to Ray Wyson. Perfect, thank you so much, Joel. Um, I'm gonna go put these full screen. Um, and like, uh, like Joel said, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them uh, into the uh, Q&A uh, section as well. We'll try to get everything answered uh, at the end of this uh, as well. Uh, welcome to a uh, inside look at the Minnesota Robotics Institute. Uh, I'm Ray Wysan. I am the uh, communications and marketing uh, person for Minri, uh, as well as the uh, building manager for Shepherd Labs. Um, and we have a we have a great panel for you. I'm, I'm really excited. Thank you to everybody um, who could stop over on this lunch hour and we're uh, hoping we you uh, uh, find a lot of this uh, super interesting. Uh, first things first, we are nestled within the East Bank uh, at the University of Minnesota campus uh, in Shepherd Laboratories. We currently do research in the newly renovated Gemini Huntley Research Laboratory. Uh, the renovation uh, took place just a couple years ago. It includes uh, several full-scale robotics laboratories uh, that just about any uh, faculty or graduate student would need to carry up on their research. Uh, newly renovated graduate and faculty offices. I'm sitting in one of them right now. I can I can say it's a great place to work, and I, I really love uh, coming here every day. Um, especially you know having worked remote, it's it's a great place to come back to. Uh, we have a uh, two-story drone lab uh, that, you know, a number of ground and aerial drone testing uh, takes place uh, weekly. We have uh, graduate classes that uh, have, have labs in there. Uh, we have fully renovated conference rooms. We have a full solar vehicle lab that our undergraduates uh, CSC group, uh, the solar vehicle team takes care of. Um, they can fully drive their solar, solar vehicle car in and out of the doors uh, for a competition for testing, um, as well as we have a lot more within the facilities. Um, they're really, really nice. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting to mention a bunch of stuff, um, but yeah. Our panelists for today uh, come from a lot from computer science and engineering. Uh, I can promise that their research is both as unique as it is interesting as well. Um, you're going to be hearing from the director of the Minnesota Robotics Institute, Nikos. Uh, first, he's going to be giving you an overview of the Minnesota Robotics Institute's uh, early successes, uh, what we hope to do in the future, uh, you know, our, our sort of goals. You'll be hearing from the uh, MS in Robotics graduate uh, program advisor, Travis Henderson. Uh, he do also does research and has a background in mechanical engineering. Our two uh, research faculty that will be uh, presenting, oh, Nikos, I think you took over a little bit too uh, early. Um, I'm gonna go back to mine. Um, our two research faculty that will be presenting, uh, Dr. Hyun Su Park and Dr. Maria Gini, are both from computer science and engineering as well. Um, they have very interesting research to present with us, as well as you'll be hearing a little bit from uh, MS in Robotics candidate, uh, Luis Guzman, who's a student in the MS in Robotics program. He has a background in applied mathematics, engineering, and physics, uh, so just a little bit more diversity from there. But you'll hear uh, about his research and maybe a little bit about his experience within the MS program, as well as uh, you'll be able to get to ask uh, everyone, uh, including myself, uh, any questions at the end of the Q&A. Um, with that, Nikos, if you want to uh, start sharing your uh, slides right now. Um, I think we're good. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Ray. So, good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, it's very, it's a great pleasure to see some uh, uh, 
old friends uh, throughout the, the... Nikos, can you turn your video on? Yep. So, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's great to see some old friends like Doug Perrin from Boston and some other graduates uh, from the program. So I will try to give you um, what is hammering at Minri. Um, first of all, let me start by saying we're very, um, we're really indebted to basically Gemini for uh, giving $10 million and possibly more in order to materialize this building and also to the state of Minnesota as part of the Min Drive initiative for supporting this line of work. And uh, I will try in the next uh, 10 minutes to give you some description of basically what is happening. I mean, you see everybody worrying about supply chain. And uh, if you see companies like Amazon, UPS, FedEx are investing heavily in warehousing and supply chain. In surgical robotics, I'm pretty sure you have heard about the Da Vinci, the Hugo robot by Medtronic. You have heard about the Google car. And also there are some uh, really interesting numbers. If you look by the year 2025, uh, the projection is that uh, almost we are going to have half a trillion business revolving around robotics. And my beloved iRobot that cleans not so good uh, comes from a company that has a capitalization that is over $2 billion. And in fact, is one of the few examples where uh, first there was a product and then there was a market that created it. And if we look at Minnesota, we have more first robotics teams per capita than any other state in the nation. And I'm pretty sure everyone has a, a, a kid, a nephew, a grandson, a granddaughter that uh, is taking part in some robotics related activity. So uh, if we look at um, I want to show you something that is happening in Amazon. So you can see this Kiva Aka Amazon robotic systems going around and uh, basically enabling uh, the delivery of things. There are several issues here, for example, uh, the integration of robots with humans, avoiding collisions making sure that all these things can be orchestrated well. Um, some very, very tough problems that go back decades in the robotics literature, but um, this enable uh, companies like Amazon to basically compete or participate in these supply chain challenges uh, in this magnitude and scale. And something else, which is also very interesting here is that uh, you can see the some of the larger robots uh, that are basically move pallets. So it's not only the mobile platforms, but also the big uh, industrial manipulators that can help uh, all this uh, revolution that is happening in warehousing and supply chain. And uh, for example, uh, when uh, I watched this video and when you go to one of these facilities is mind boggling. I mean, the one that we have near in Sakopi has more than 2000 trucks and more than 600 robots operating at any given time. So as we see this, uh, what are some of the gaps uh, that we try to help fill in? If you look, there is a lack of proper training. Engineering is a very old discipline, but uh, robotics is more than engineering. It has uh, psychology, it has architecture, it has design, it has uh, basically perception. There are also concerns about data privacy and loss of jobs and how actually we can say that um, some of these things are uh, protected and also that there are new jobs a new type of jobs which are created. We need to look at a redesign of planning, control, sensing, and actuation, because we want to have these systems fielded. 
uh, we have moved from the area of basically just a fundamental uh, laboratory research that does not translate to research that basically needs not only to be part of a very complex supply chain system or part of a surgery, but also something that's going to have guaranteed results. We lack uh, benchmarks. We need to create these benchmarks. And the last thing, which I think is very, very critical, the investment in human resources. We need to have the ability to attract and retain high quality faculty and students. In fact, out of uh, 20 PhD students the last few years that they have graduated, only one was interested in going to academia. He had more than 12 interviews, uh, like six offers. So unless we have faculty and students, this robotics enterprise is very difficult to be successful. So the areas of the robotics institutes revolve around cognition, perception, robot control and modeling, and also robotics hardware. As this apply to some key uh, application domains, which are very important for Minnesota and the country, like agriculture, environmental monitoring, medicine, manufacturing, and also we place a heavy emphasis on outreach and commercialization. Now, what the students have produced, and we're really, really uh, glad to have these great students around that enable us to do some of these things that you see here. This is Ruben Desa, who is senior scientist at OpenAI. He was with us since uh, the early days as an NSF uh, REU and then NSF fellow. And you can see he has built a system uh, that basically starts as a rotor craft, does this amazing transformation that you are going to see in a little bit. Uh, think about this happening at one fifth, what you see basically at five times the speed of what you see here and uh, transforms itself to a fixed wing state. And then you can see another transformation. So depending on the task at hand, you can uh, basically decide about the configuration you want. And then you can pick, for example, the rotor or you can pick the fixed wing. And uh, you can see the excitement or you can hear the excitement. Now you can see the excitement of basically this meaning after all these years, he was able to get his PhD. Now, when you see this, uh, you need someone uh, that is able to do the design, but also is going to be able to do the uh, programming. So we need people who have a completely different approach that blend mechanical, computer science, electrical engineering, and they are willing to fail. Uh, failure is very important in robotics because you can learn a lot of lessons and you can design mechanisms which are far more effective uh, for the future. So the next system is actually by Travis, uh, the, the one that you saw um, Earlier it was open loop. So this is, you can see an earlier, um, you saw the earlier version. Now you can see the newer version that has this uh, ability to control. And you can see basically flying inside the drone lab. This is also an introduction of the space. Please watch the nets that basically protect the lab from uh, failures that may happen. And um, we are very happy to have these great students. Um, for example, Ruben, uh, although his PhD is in mechanical engineering, he was several years with us. Uh, he was a mid drive scholar, an NSF RU, an NSF graduate fellow. And then we are going to hear about Luis, who is going to, is going to be 
graduating soon and is going to be one of the three people who are joining Amazon. Uh, in particular, Luis will tell you more about his experience and basically his role in uh, many things, including uh, outreach. So what is the future of robotics? I'm asked often uh, this question. I can say that uh, we can build things, but um, basically we are creating through sensing a lot of data and trying to get to make sense out of this data, organize them, just move to the next level. I think it's going to be extremely important. So data, as it is produced by these complex platforms, I think is something we are striving to go. So the new directions is Robotics Plus X, where we are trying to use these systems in order to produce huge data sets. We think a data-centric approach is essential. This approach requires robotics that can harvest, process, and analyze the data and extract useful insights. And right now, there is very little training, in particular training that involves exposure of the students to research, to building real systems, and also having diverse skills such as machine learning, statistics, cloud computing, and visualization. So I'm going to stop here, and uh, I'm going to pass the baton to Dr. Park. Dr. Park, you should uh, be ready to be all good to share your screen. Uh, if you just want to make sure your video is on, that's perfect too. Thank you. So can you see my screen? Looks great. Right. So thank you. Uh, I'm Kasu Park, Assistant Professor in Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, I have been working on modeling 3D geometry of humans and animals using a computer visions. And here I would like to talk about uh, uh, the, how to track the monkeys. So why am I interested in monkeys? Okay. So AI have been making a grand, groundbreaking uh, progress in many domains, including medical imaging. Okay. For instance, AI can analyze uh, MRI images based on big data to detect, uh, diagnose, and predict the fatal disease in our body okay. using this MRI scanning, uh, which transformed the way we think uh, medicines. But the, the AI is still lagging behind to understand our mind. Okay. Let's take a look at this video of autistic children. Okay. He's talking his mom Bye -bye, as other uh, normal, happy kids. Hey, I love you. But once ah. he hears the sound of his brother, he starts to get irritated. So here's another example where the kid is a troublemaking eye contact with the people in the photo shoot. Right. So uh, we distinguish this uh, characteristic behavior of autism spectrum disorder children by reading their facial expression, gestures, body pose, and, and even vocalization, and without any MRI scanning of our brain. Okay? We can just understand this behavior. So based, uh, we can process this uh, using this facial expression body gestures. Okay? However, there's a no AI algorithm that allow us to understand or read our behaviors. So my team at Un uh, University of Minnesota focus on the behavior imaging. Try to understand the relationship between our body movements and mind. So, and in neuroscience, uh, this has been studied with monkeys. For instance, here I'm showing the video of a monkey who is uh, navigating into the, this uh, uh, large space uh, where we implant electrode on their brain to measure the brain signals on top, I'm showing on the uh, right top corner. Okay. In this, at the same time, monkeys freely navigate the space by interacting with objects, wires, and even sometimes with other monkeys. However, this is not sufficient to study the relationship between brain and motor activities. Because to study the, this problem, we need a measurement from the body movement in relation to the uh, neural activities. So what we can, what we have so far, is ability to measure the brain activity. So then how do we measure 
the body movement. So existing body measurement systems rely on fiducial markers, which provide XYZ location of attached markers. As shown here, uh, the, the actors where uh, put there is a uh, markers on their face okay? that is used for the, the, in the movie industry. Okay? However, this is not applicable for monkeys because they are very sensitive uh, to these markers and they, they are very uncomfortable with the markers. They always tear off these markers. Okay? So the markers put on the body, this is not an option for the monkey stuff. So to track the behaviors of monkeys, uh, we built a large camera system called the uh, Open Monkey Studio in collaboration with uh, neuroscientists Ben Hayden and, and Jan Jinsman, uh, which facilitate the 62 HD camera that surrounds the monkey stage where it can provide a full 360 views of the monkey. Okay. So here I'm showing the multi-view images seen by this is 62 cameras, okay? Uh, provide this full, full, full 360 view uh, degree angles. And, and each video is HD resolution. We can observe the monkey poster clearly from these images. So uh, with this uh, system, so we built a machine learning algorithm to detect the monkey pose, a location of 17 landmarks, such as a shoulder, head, hand, face, and so on, using this RGB camera. We don't have any uh, markers on their body. Okay? So which allow us to track the monkey without any fiducial markers. Uh, uh, so therefore we can actually measure that their naturalistic behaviors in, in this cage. And the system that we built is also agnostic to the number of monkeys. So here I'm showing the social interaction between monkeys. Okay. Two monkeys are situated in the same environment where we can track their activities simultaneously that facilitate the studying a lot of interesting behavior questions. For instance, communications, reciprocal behavior metering, ranking and sexual behaviors and so on. And so now we have a tracking uh, system for the monkey where we can actually study the relationship between mind and body movement. For instance, with the, this camera system uh, on, the, on the right, I'm showing the 3D reconstruction of the body movement of a monkey in the cage. And in the same time, we can uh, measure the, their brain activities. Okay? Uh, brain activities so using this electrode uh, which provide uh, the, which allow us to relate the, the, the motor activities and brain activities. So our hypothesis is that there exists a strong correlation between brain activities and emotions. So to prove this hypothesis, uh, we designed a very simple neural network that can predict XYZ location, 3D location of monkey given the brain signal represented by the, this uh, brain activities. So if the neural network is highly predictive of the 3D location of monkey, this indicates that the, for the first time, we can prove that there is a strong relationship between mind and body movement computationally. So here's like a preliminary result where I'm showing uh, x-axis represent the time, y-axis is the xyz coordinate, and uh, here are blue showing the ground truth location of the monkey. Okay? Or, uh, over XYZ location. And here I'm showing the prediction of the 3D location from the brain signals, okay? The red is the, again, the prediction of the location from the brain signals. Of course, it is noisy, but you see that the strong correlation between the, your prediction and the ground truth, which means that um, by measuring behavior signal, we can predict the, where the monkey is located and, 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 and basically it tells us that, that there is a, a brain reason that actually tells us like a GPS location of you. So another research effort that we are undertaking is a generalization. So I'm showing the, the monkey interactions in the case. Now we are pushing this into the wild, not in the lab, okay? Uh, here I'm showing the video of a monkey interacting with each other's from the Minnesota Zoo and multiple monkeys are constantly interacting with others by forming some bigger society with the ranking and the roles. 
And uh, so this is a one of uh, ongoing research, but we hope that in the future, uh, we can understand their behavior relation in relation to their mind. So of course our study is not limited to the primate or monkeys. We study the behavior of humans using a lot, a lot of data. Here I'm showing that some of our data collection effort to model the human geometry using the multi-camera systems. So here, this is a video of a person doing actions in front of cameras. And this is a measure from multiple views. And actually we use hundreds of cameras to, to measure the behaviors. And of course, uh, we collect the data from the many different subjects and include more than 700 subjects. So with this data, so what we can do is we can model the precisely, precise 3D geometry of attention or gaze directions. And also we can model their facial expressions. These types of data can be used to model the geometry of humans and that can be in turn used for uh, understanding the behaviors of autistic spectrum disorders. And here's another uh, examples where we reconstruct the 3D geometry of the human hands from these multi-view videos. All right, so in summary, we are interested in the mind and, 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 and the behaviors and manifestations of the mind uh, where we can, we can observe. So there is a no AI system that allow us to read our mind from our behaviors. And in our lab, we actually devoted to uh, innovate the computer vision and AI to develop the AI that can read our mind. So that concludes me and my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Park. I am going to share my slides again, and Travis is going to talk to us about the MSN Robotics Program. And I can't oh. quite see, so Travis, let me know when you're ready to go. Okay, we're all ready here. Cool, sounds good. Sweet. Well, uh, welcome, everyone, once again. I'm Travis, and uh, I'd like to give you a 50,000-foot view of what's going on inside, inside this new Masters in Robotics program. This is actually a fairly new program. We accepted our first cohort of students in fall of 2020. And uh, all things considered, we, we've been very pleased, uh, actually exceptionally pleased with how this program has grown, even in this short time. To put it in a sentence or two, this robotics program is designed to be completed over three semesters and it's 31 credits and we try very hard to combine theoretical and practical so we pair real world issues in an educational setting and we also give students the opportunity to do their academic study uh, with uh, companies and we also try to partner with companies quite a quite a bit uh, during the study and beyond the study. To break it down and how we have designed this program, uh, we have to remember that robots are defined in, in many different ways, but one of the, the nicest definitions of what a robot is, is it's something that can think, it can sense, and it can act. According to that, we have divided up this program into three key course areas cognition, the thinking part, perception, the sensing part, and robot modeling and control, or the acting part. Uh, students take courses in each of these three areas as a way to capture the depth that robotics is. It's not just any one particular discipline of the you know, four main engineering disciplines, it's all of them together. And one might argue it's even more than the sum of its parts because any roboticist has to know a, a fair amount about each of these different areas in order to uh, leverage and uh, synthesize uh, really practical, practical solutions in the real world. So students take courses in each of these three key areas and they also provide depth to their interests and their study through um, the taking of electives. Uh, these electives are, again, uh, uh, classes that are offered in, in the classical uh, engineering uh, disciplines, aerospace, computer science, electrical, mechanical, and we add to that as well. Um, it, it design, biomedical, uh, 
the 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 more diversity we put into these courses, um, the the more applicable this this robotics program can be to the very many many applications that robotics can be found in. Um, students choose between two different plan types, a plan A and plan B. The, those are the uh, thesis or research-based masters or a capstone project-based masters. The, you can think of them as maybe breadth and depth. The, the depth uh, perhaps can be thought of as the thesis where students will take uh, their work that they have learned during their academic study and they will heavily investigate, deeply investigate a particular research question. And this is particularly geared towards students who might be interested in a career in academia or pursuing a PhD after um, their time in the robotics master's program. Capstone projects um, are uh, projects that are usually done in concert with industry partners. So they have, they're very applications oriented. And this is a great way to, for students to get hands on uh, application of their study in real world contexts. Uh, if you would, next slide, please, Ray. So as I mentioned, this is a fairly new program. We admitted our first cohort of about 30 students-ish or 26 students in, uh, in fall of 2020. Um, 35 students were actually uh, registered for this fall 2021 uh, cohort that was just recently admitted this semester. So in total, we have 65 students in the program. Uh, when you count up all of the different kinds of support that these students have garnered, over 50% of these students are supported either directly by MINRI or through teaching assistantships or through research positions with faculty uh, in, at the university. So it's a, a, a wonderful breadth of students, uh, lots of research going on and uh, outreach as well. Um, through some of the support from MINRI. And uh, as I mentioned, this is a new program and it's designed for three semesters. So we've had one student graduate already and several more are scheduled to graduate in this uh, coming semester. Uh, next slide. So we have a bunch of industry connections, both with uh, for a variety of applications. Um, we have Amazon, uh, to which some of our students are going to be heading out after they graduate this semester. Um, folks like Honeywell uh, and uh, Medtronics and Terra, MinDot, uh, they've supported students um, getting their, their uh, degrees here at the U of M. And we have a host of other uh, folks who have partnered with us for a variety of reasons, everything uh, including uh, working on research projects um, that are in specific fields, um, such as uh, medical fields like histosonics. Um, I want to give the remainder of this time to one of our students, uh, Luis Guzman, who will talk a little bit about his experience in the program. Yeah, hey everyone. Um, so yeah, I, I've been working on a research project uh, kind of over the last year, and uh, this has kind of turned into my thesis that I'm going to be finishing up. Um, but I'm essentially looking at the problem of uh, teaching robots new skills just by watching human demonstrations. And so even with some of the recent advancements in machine learning, there are uh, some tasks that are still difficult for robots to accomplish. And so um, I'm essentially looking at bridging that gap to teach robots these difficult skills by watching humans do the same thing. And so uh, kind of how this is working, um, we have a motion capture system in the lab uh, that consists of a bunch of cameras placed around the room. And uh, those watch me as I kind of make different motions and complete different tasks. And uh, then you can find the joint angles as I'm doing that. And so those can be mapped to the robot. And so then the robot can essentially learn both the goal of a certain task and then also how to complete that goal. And so the, uh, the video on the bottom here is basically showing how a robot can mimic human motion. And it's also aware of any obstacles in the workspace. So uh, kind of whenever it gets close to the table, 
it still stops before a collision actually happens, uh, while also mimicking the motion as closely as possible. Um, what, one of the really kind of cool parts about this system is that the robot can actually learn to do a skill better than the human demonstration. And so um, the demonstrations kind of serve as an initial guide to the robot, but then it's still able to do its own learning and potentially surpass the expert performance. And so uh, kind of next steps on this project are to record myself doing a bunch of different tasks in the motion capture system, and then just seeing how the robot can generalize to different scenarios. Thank you, Luis. Sorry, I had a little uh, hiccup with uh, my mouse. Um, I think with that, we're going to pass it off to uh, Maria Jeannie. I'll stop my uh, screen share. Uh, Dr. Jeannie, if you want to. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Let me get this started. OK, so suppose that now instead of having a, a single robot, like very often happens, now we have more robots. Uh, and I'm trying to try to explore the space. If you go, you know, a small number, maybe 10, maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000, would it make any sense? So if we look at the, what the research has been done, the multi-robot systems have been studied for more than 20 years, but they're not too, too many practical applications. Amazon is one of the exceptions. So what I'll talk here, is about briefly about two different projects. And one is when you have a relatively small number of robots and you want to allocate tasks to each robot individually. And the specific feature here is going to be allocating tasks that have temporal and precedence constraints. And I'll get to an example. And then we'll kind of jump up at the top of the scale. And suppose that now you have 10,000 robots. I don't think anybody's ever had 10,000 robots. What can you do? So let me start with the allocation to smaller group of robots. And this is a simple example of allocating some kind of surveillance task. And if you look, you know, you have, let's see a map with different rooms. We have some robots and I'll show here some of the robots. And suppose that the task that you have, you want to have, a, say you want to watch a room between some time window for a specific amount of time and maybe again another room, different time window. And then you say, check some critical areas in this room three first. So if you take a look at the kind of constraints that we're specifying here is of course, the task to do, watch a room or check an area, but also there are temporal constraints and our precedence constraints. To make this a little more clear, I just try to say how we formulate the problem. Is an optimization problem. And we're trying to allocate the task to minimize some kind of objective, and one could be what is called the make span, which is the time for the last task to finish a job. Or we can do a combination of minimize the time it takes to do the job, also the distance travel, or any other kind of optimization metrics that we want. And we have constraints. And I'm showing here, just again, to give more clear intuition, uh, precedence constraints is simply you know, some kind of uh, links that connect, tell you which task is to be done before which other task. It could be a kind of a complex uh, network. And uh, temporal constraints are typically are done using what are called time windows. And what you see down in the figure here, you can say that's the earliest time the task can start, and that's the latest finish time, and you have an expected duration. You know, like in example before, between eight and nine for 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, this is more complex than most of the task allocations typically have been done. And how do we solve the problem? I'm not going to go to too many details here, just give you the intuition here. We use uh, auctions, auctions, you know, like eBay, everybody's kind of thinking familiar with auctions. And each robot uh, bids on a task and there's an auctioneer that then selects uh, the lowest bid that tries to again, achieve the, whatever is the optimization objective. Now, one thing that of course we assume the robots are kind of nice to each other. You know, when you bid on eBay, you try to beat somebody else. In this case, you are very, the robots are very honest and they bid what is their true cost and they try to be cooperative. What does it mean and how well does it work? 
This is an example, of course, that we apply this kind of algorithm, not just to robot, but also to vehicles uh, in kind of vehicle routing problems. And this we're using a, a simple example using a standard data set that is used for vehicle routing. There are time windows, good number of tasks. In this case, there are 10 robots. The tasks are kind of clustered, as you can see in the, in the figures. Uh, and uh, the time windows are kind of tight, so you have to be very careful. Now, what we show here in the right hand side, we show the results of our algorithm. As, as you see, each robot, so different colors correspond to the different robots and the path that they do. Again, because a small cluster, each robot is allocated basically a cluster and does all the jobs there, which is really the best that you can do. Other algorithms we showed down don't do the same job, and so things are much more nice. So this gives us an idea the algorithm really works quite well. Uh, but just to be a little more clear, let, I'll show this a sh relatively short video of task. The robots move relatively slowly because this we... video depicts the allocation and execution of 12 tasks by three turtle bots using prioritized iterated auction. The split screens show videos shot with the robots' cameras, and the static image show allocations of tasks to robots. The colors in the figures encode precedence constraints. Red precedes blue, blue precedes green, and green precedes yellow. All the other tasks in turquoise are free of precedence constraints. Tasks are shown as circles and robots as squares. Robots assignments represented as paths coincide with their colors. The tasks here are visits to waypoints and once there, the robots turn around to take a video of the location. Okay, hopefully this gives you kind of a idea. Of course, that this video seems to have been run during COVID when the building was empty, but it was kind of run late in the afternoon. Now, let's move to the other end of the spectrum. And suppose now I have 10,000 robots, very large number of robots. And what you see here in this uh, short video is the result of a simulation. And all these dots that you see moving, those are all some of those 10,000 robots. We got up to 15,000 robots. Uh, they try to do foraging, which means look for something and take it to a destination, which is in this case is in the center of the area, is what is called the nest in the kind of the terminology. And why people want to do this? Well, you can think about the very natural mapping to real world problems. Insects tend to do this kind of things, you know, ants typically, they go around and find food and then they bring it back to the nest. But you can also think about something like Amazon. We saw Amazon before, and now you know, you have these huge warehouses, lots of rubber going around, running, doing things. And uh, they cannot really be fully coordinated centrally because there are too many. You cannot have you know, a centralized controller that controls a lot of robots. So we're really looking into how can each robot decides on its own what to do, but at the same time, there must be some kind of coordination because you don't want to run into the other robots. So, so just to give you, oops, I don't want to show this again. So a specific task that we started looking at uh, is um, a task again in which this is shown in a more abstract way. You have a source of stuff. You have a nest, which is where you have to take uh, whatever you pick up. Again, analogy here comes from animal foraging. And what you can see in here, kind of different ways of doing a task. What is called a generalist, which is one shown in the top, in which a robot goes from a source all the way to the nest. This, I think, again, what often ants tend to do. But you can also think about having kind of a place in between. This is called task interface or cache. And so you can have a robot that are harvesters. So they pick up the food and they take to the interface. And then some other collectors that go from the interface and take to the nest. And this is just a simple idea. So they compose the task in different ways. So the robots don't all do exactly the same thing. Can we get better result? Can we improve the efficiency? Can we reduce? The congestion, can you reduce collisions, which are always the problematic. And here, just again, to give you a little bit sense of this, uh, I show again a short video. This is a simulator we use, which is called Argos. And all those things that you go around kind of slowly uh, are the robots uh, and they carry, you see they're carrying big objects. Uh, and the area 
with the three yellow dots. So this is kind of the nest, and they can recognize the location of the nest, kind of look in the light. And again, this gives you an idea. Again, this is very slow, but just to show you know, how we can have independent robots doing different things. Now, of course, one of the important things that we need to do is to try to find ways of measuring how well do they do the work. Because you know, at the all at the end, we're all kind of you know computer scientists or engineers. They say, okay, it looks cute. They go around, but do they accomplish the task? And what would be good metrics? So one of the things we develop, we define different metrics for measuring the main properties. Now it's known in the literature that swarm of robots have kind of fundamentally four main properties. One which is called emergent self-organization, and I'll talk a little bit more, a tiny bit more about that. One is called scalability. So if, if I have 10 robots, how much can I do? But if I have 100 robots, I have 1,000 robots, 10,000 robots, how much the system scales up with the number of robots and, of course, the size also of the environment? Flexibility, which is the ability to react and to adapt to the situation, since each robot makes its own decision they have more ability to, to react and to change when environment changes as opposed to have a centralized control there. And their property is robustness, which is robustness to kind of noise from the sensor and the actuators. You know, the, the controller tells the robot to go in some direction, but sometimes the direction isn't quite right. Sometimes the sensors have some kind of noise. And the ability also to be robust to the population dynamics as the, as the locations and the movement that the other robots do, can the robots be robust and not really get stuck and say, I have no idea what to do. And so we designed a bunch of metrics, which are kind of predictive and help really do go through simulation and try to predict the performance of the swarm. And I spent the last minute here, I spent talking a little bit about this property, which is kind of most interesting property for swarm. It's called emergent self-organization. And the idea is that uh, there are collective behaviors that often appears when you have a swarm of robots that are not explicitly encoded as part of the individual programs and really emerge in a sense from the interaction of the robots with each other. And we're going to show here in a very simplified way, this kind of theory, you know, you can think about uh, if you increase this, the size of the swarm, you expect the performance to increase somehow linearly, right? You think, well, if I have 20 robots, I get some performance. If I have 30, 40, 60, 800, my performance will increase. And then the other lines that we show here is now if instead of having the robots kind of are simply increasing, uh, each one does exactly the same thing. Now, when I have all the robots together, the performance that is achieved often is quite different and is the more curved line that I show here. Often for smaller sizes, the performance is not growing linearly, it's sublinear, but at some point, often you get to the point where you have super linear performance. And that's really what is desirable, right? Because then you get more than, than the number of robots will give you if they were to act independently. And this again happens because the robots interact with each other and, and affect their own operations. Again, I'm not going to go into more details here. We don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to, before you know, finishing, I want to thank, of course, all this work is always done by students. And here I showed um, three students, John Harwell, Lana Lowenstone, and Ernesto Nunes, uh, that have been working on this, on this project. Ernesto worked on the project with the task allocation with temporal constraints, uh, and Lana and John are working, are currently students, and are working on the swarm project. Thank you for your attention. I can stop sharing. Thank you, Maria. That's uh, incredibly, incredibly great research. Um, we're going to be moving on to the Q and A section. Um, Nikos has been doing a great job of typing out um, some of the answers um, to a few questions that have popped up already. So I'm going to um, quick go over that uh, myself and kind of answer the ones that I know I can uh, give an answer to as well. Um, as well as just go over Nikos's answers as um, as he typed them as as we go. Um, so uh, hey, Travis and Nikos, if you want to turn on your videos to join everyone on the screen for the Q and A, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Joel. Um, so it, it was mentioned that fifty percent of the students um, from the MS program were giving. Um, some funding opportunities. Vipul just wanted us to elaborate about sort of the funding amounts and whatnot. Um, Nikos mentioned that every applicant is considered for about half tuition support um, plus $1,000 monthly stipend for the first semester. Um, 
uh, we mentioned that um, there are a lot of TA ships, RA ships, uh, and industry internships. Um, I don't think we counted all of the sort of industry internships or job support as well um, in that official 50% metric. So even more students uh, um, are getting uh, industry internships or internships because of connections, I think, with Minri. We always try to support um, sort of through job and, and internship opportunities as well. Um, and feel free, anybody else on the panel, to add in as we go as well. Um, uh, Joe uh, Coyle mentioned uh, that uh, Gemini was mentioned as a large donor for this facility um, and wanted details on their donation. Um, they provided, again, millions for the building, uh, among other things, um, and, and continue to sort of look at student support. Um, most of the support I think that we uh, will be receiving financially in the future, I think a lot of it will try to go directly to student support and ECOS. Um, I know we've been looking at that. Um, we don't have any definitives, um, but of course we're um, always on the lookout for, for more support financially and are optimistic um, that we will receive some as well. Um, currently, we do not offer a PhD program in robotics. Um, that is, of course, um, a primary goal of the center. Uh, we started out um, with the MS program, um, getting that running, running well and making sure that our students um, have the support that they need before we expand the program. Um, but that is definitely next steps as we expand. And Nico's mentioned um, that we're getting a new dean in CSC, um, and that'll be uh, top priority as, as the dean comes in. Um, Nico's mentioned that so there is about 15% um, women in the MS program as well. Um, the first program or the first cohort had a little bit more uh, women in the program than the second, but of course we're always looking for um, just about as diverse of a cohort as we could possibly have. Um, I know um, Dr. Park mentioned, uh, Dr. Jeannie mentioned, Travis mentioned that um, having as diverse of a mindset um, in robotics as possible is always helpful. There are so many applications for robotics, so of course um, we're looking to uh, reflect that within our robotics cohort. Um, and then Joe also wanted to know about um, research, outreach opportunities. Uh, for high school first robotics teams. Uh, Nikos mentioned that we provided mentorship to first teams uh, before COVID. Obviously COVID complicates a lot of things. Um, we've always been, um, we, we've always ran summer tech camps before uh, COVID and we're looking to, um, you know, provided uh, restrictions are lifted, uh, get that up and running again. Of course, uh, we don't know because we are a state entity. So we always try to follow uh, state guidelines when that happens. We also offer um, tours. Again, they uh, kind of have been put on pause because of COVID, but we offer tours of the facility as well um, to uh, high school classes as well as first robotics teams um, uh, and everything from that. Um, I think... Um, uh, Nikos, if you could uh, kind of chime in. Alex had a question. Um, I, I know uh, you mentioned that, um, or you answered this, but uh, Alex just had a question about, um, he was highly interested in computer vision, has already been doing some research, um, is an undergraduate um, in the computer science and engineering department, but uh, what is the best way to sort of reach out and find out how to best contribute uh, to any research uh, given the experience, Nikos, could you maybe touch on this? I know we have a lot of resources on our websites, including all of our faculty connections. Um, uh, any computer vision that's listed on there, um, feel free to reach out to those uh, professors as well as um, maybe think about applying for the MS and Robotics program. I know entering the program, uh, we definitely have a lot of support for our students, um, as well as uh, really try to connect them with uh, any faculty that they that might fit their interests. Um, does anybody, Nikos, do you have anything to add to that at all? I think the most effective way is actually get to know the faculty you are interested to work or the researcher you are interested to work. And uh, the faculty want to see you in a classroom setting. So always I say, just try to take a class that fits your schedule and you're going to get something that you can utilize in your particular project and then see, for example, if this is, if there is the right chemistry. Also, several of us have uh, our user research experiences for undergraduates. This is like uh, around $1,000 a year, but we want to see um, 
the students performing um, a, a certain mini project for three months before basically we make a commitment like this because these are highly competitive. Uh, there is another question because uh, it's related to this. When is the deadline for uh, application? So in order to be considered for financial support, uh, we have a deadline at the beginning of March. Uh, basically, we would like to see all these applications. Just to give you an idea, last year we had more than 160 applicants for 35 positions. So it's getting more and more competitive as we go. But uh, there is another option. Uh, we don't want to exercise this as often, but if someone is very much interested, we can consider even spring admission. But last year we admitted three students only out of tens of applicants for spring. And the reason is that we want students that have uh, some exposure because we cannot offer a colloquium, we cannot offer some of the normal things we are offering as part of the normal cycle. I don't know if Maria or, or uh, Hsin Su want to say anything about the first uh, question. No, I mean, I, I think you did perfectly right. I mean, just, just to be really honest, because, you know, at the end of the day, we are all scientists, so truth in advertising. Uh, there are lots of undergraduate students who are interested in doing research, many more than the students that can really do with faculty, because the number of faculty is finite, and the number of students sometimes feels like an infinite number. I mean, we have thousands of students, you know, which is wonderful, and they're all very, very good students. So what, as Nicholas was saying, is really important, try to make a connection with the faculty uh, and make sure, again, take a class or do something, because otherwise, you know, if you just send an email, unfortunately, often we cannot respond to every email, just because there are too many. But, uh, but again, if you are in a class, you know, if I get an email from a student in my class and say, I want to do research with you, I always respond because I have a duty to respond to students in my classes. The other ones I love to do, but sometimes I can't. So, you know, try also, there are clubs, there are groups of students that connect together. And so again, try to find, you know, there is a, the solar car projects that are other opportunities and try to, to become noticeable. And, you know, one way is to, you have to be very good and some creativity. I saw one of the questions was asked about other creative applications of robotics. And maybe, you know, we can kind of share some ideas. I think the main one, uh, and Nikos is the expert here, is agricultural application of robotics. You know, it's, it's becoming a hot field. Search and rescue, which is another kind of era where it's still very difficult, but, uh, you know, robots are becoming more and more uh, capable. Again, agriculture, I think, is the next big open frontier. Uh, but again, there may be other creativity is always uh, strongly encouraged. Mm -hmm. And um, we're running out of time. So I'm going to touch on one question and then give the last one to Luis, uh, since he was so gracious to be here on short notice. Um, we There was a question about GREs. We do not actually require the GRE at this time. We found that especially with COVID, it was easier just to um, let it go. Plus, we figured that, you know, undergrad research and everything else probably gave us a better um, idea of, of who would succeed in the program. And then, Luis, um, what do you hope to pursue after graduating? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll be graduating in December. Um, so I actually already lined up a job. Um, I'm going to be working with uh, Amazon Go out in Seattle doing uh, computer vision research. And so I I think that's definitely one of the strong points of the program. Um, I kind of uh, got to explore all, tons of different topics. My thesis is in uh, kind of learning from demonstrations and uh, reinforcement learning, but um, I also got plenty of computer vision experience also. And so kind of having those extra opportunities uh, really helped me line up a job afterwards. And so I'm super excited about it. All right, thank you so much. Um, uh, real quick, there was one more thing that popped up. It says, is there any way to get my fee waived for a uh, fall 2022 application? I believe that is all handled with University of Minnesota generally their uh, graduate department. So I would highly recommend going to the uh, graduates, um, graduate admission uh, websites at the University of Minnesota as well for that. Um, I'll pass it to Joelle. I think she has some parting words for us, but thank you everybody for attending. Uh, we really appreciate uh, 
you being here. And I think you'll uh, receive a follow up email with, um, you know, where to go with more questions as well as our websites and et cetera, all the links. Great. Thanks so much, Ray. And thank you so much once again to all of our presenters. As Ray said, we will be sending an email with a link to the recording of this presentation that usually takes us about a week. Um, but we'll put together links to the uh, website and any of the faculty members' websites that were mentioned and so forth. So watch for that for additional resources. I do want to also just highlight a, an upcoming event. We do have a mix of both virtual and in-person events coming up for 2022. It feels very strange to say that. And the first one that's going to be coming up if you live locally in the Twin Cities area is an in-person event on January 29th. It's the return of our annual alumni social and curling lesson. If you've ever seen curling on the Olympics and you've wondered what it's like, uh, this is your chance to give it a try with a bunch of other CSC alumni and friends. And it's always a really fun time. Everyone falls down and laughs about it together. Uh, it's, it's a lot harder than it looks on TV. So watch for your inbox uh, in December if you're interested in that. We'll start registration uh, probably a little bit before Christmas. And for a full list of all the events coming up at the college, whether hosted by the college, departments, centers, or institutes like MINRI, you can always check csc.umn.edu slash events. And if you have any questions, you can contact me and my colleagues at csclumni at umn.edu. So thanks for sticking around. I know we're shortly after one, but I hope you learned something new today. Thank you again to all of our presenters for making time to be with us today and to share this little taste of what they're working on and what's happening inside MINRI. And a big thank you to all of you for making time to attend. I hope you enjoyed it and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much.